I'm Dave. And I'm Rob, the last minute astronomer. And we're here with Ron Breacher. And I just had an opportunity to see Ron's Masters of Pix Insight workshop the other night. How are you doing, Ron? I'm doing great. Awesome. Really nice to be here. Excellent. So, uh, Ron, can you just kind of uh, give us some background? Um, how did you get started with astrophotography? I mean, this is such an amazing hobby. I've been doing it for a number of years, and I know that a lot of our, our guests are probably interested in learning more. Our listeners are um, from various backgrounds, but many, I believe, are at some point interested in looking at astrophotography, at least, or maybe even doing it themselves. So how did you get involved? Well, you know, I started out as a visual astronomer, and I'm still uh, a really passionate visual astronomer. You might have seen a post uh, yesterday or today of my wife and I. We had a bunch of people out in the driveway last night with a couple of, like a 10-inch and a 20-inch club, looking at the moon and planets and a few deep sky objects. So visual first for me. And uh, astronom uh, uh, astrophotography came later. So visual astronomy, everybody... Everybody who does it has a creation story. So mine has like four legs on the stool. I started really in 1997 when we moved into the house that I live in now. My wife was pregnant with my daughter, my second child, and my son was about three and a half years old. So we moved to the country and the skies are kind of dark, which was cool to start with. My old bank said, you have all these visa points before we close down your mortgage and your visa. Do you want to use your points to, to take something from our catalog? And I got what I thought was a toy telescope from my son. Turned out it was a four and a half inch reflector. Um, and it was good enough that I saw the moon and Jupiter and Saturn, which completely blew me away. Meanwhile, my daughter was born and my daughter uh, was colicky. So she screamed a lot at night. And the way I soothed her was to put her over my, over my forearm and walk her up and down the driveway until she settled down. And so I'm walking up and down the driveway with this darker sky and getting hooked on the stars. I have this really, um, uh, cheap telescope that got me hooked, but it's really unsatisfying, hard to find anything. It's rickety and so on. Anyway, Christmas comes along and my business partner gives me Terence Dickinson's book, Night Watch. Um, a lot of astronomers get started with that book, Night Watch. And um, I did. I read it from cover to cover and I was particularly interested in chapter four which was choosing and using a telescope. And uh, they had a sidebar article um, with a picture of my telescope entitled Junk Scopes from Asia. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, <laughs> I realized that it wasn't me that was the weak link here. And I took my bonus money that year and bought a real telescope, an Ultima 2000 and uh never looked back i mean i've had many telescopes since then but that's how i got started visually and then i got into sky and telescope and astronomy magazine and so on oh wait i just got to circle back to night watch for a second the fifth edition of night watch was just released a week or two ago my photos on the cover i saw that that is nice. so awesome congratulations that is, on that like i can't tell you Terence Dickinson picked that photo. Um, and, uh, you know, he's responsible for so many of us getting into this hobby. But uh, to your first question, how did I get into astrophotography? So now I've done visual, I'm doing visual for a while. And I tried not to use, I didn't use the computer much. Um, basically, I would use a flashlight and a star chart. And I kept a I'm just going to step up for a second. I want to grab something to show you. I have a three-volume handwritten log. 
That's my volume one of my logbook. And I kept this log for years until I started astrophotography. And I did some sketches. Uh, nothing really fancy. I've got a, um, my very first photos are in here. So this is July 2002. I took a picture of some sunspots by holding up a camera to a telescope. Um, but one day, 2002. You were doing film at that first? Was, that was film, yeah. So that was film. We'll have to circle back to that a little later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did film. <laughs> it was hard with film. But regardless, um, where I, I that was just dabbling. When I really got hooked was around 2006 or so. I got an issue of Sky and Telescope. By this time, I, I really knew my way well, well around the sky and I had favorite objects and so on. And one of them is Globular Cluster M13. Love it visually. Yeah, it's beautiful. Definitely the my favorite globular cluster also. Yeah. But um, there was a, in the back of Sky and Telescope, there's a, a reader gallery, of reader photos. There was a picture of, um, of M13, and I read the credit, and it was shot with the same DSLR that I owned and a scope similar to one that I owned. And I went to my wife and I said, I, I got to try this. I have to do this. There you go. And it got I, you hooked. <laughs> oh, my goodness. There, and then there's no, right? That's I right. was absolutely hooked. So that would have been around 2006. For my 50th birthday in 2009, Gail bought me an observatory on the other awesome. side of my driveway. Uh, we had Wayne Parker from Skyshed install it nice and he and i sat on a couch and drank beer in my driveway while it, while the installers erected that shed and then when they went away we got the pier installed and i was imaging the same night wow and that yeah and uh you know i've had all kinds of equipment changes since then but that's how i got started so, that's a great story and the observatory it that's a game changer in terms of productivity it's yeah you don't spend time setting up and tearing down and flat you know flat frames last until a speck of dust falls somewhere you know yep. they last a long time so speaking of the uh the the first astrophotography you were doing and seeing what other people could do i have i have a little three question trivia for the three of you okay Okay. Let's see. Let's see what you get now. Um, let's see, Dave. You have to answer first, okay? Oh. And then Ron, Ron's going to answer after that, okay? All right. So, first question um, is: When was the first photograph of an astronomical object taken, and what was it of? Oh no. <laughs> um, your first day. And it's not multiple choice, so you just kind of have to go. Hmm. I, I, this is hard, and I do not know the answer, so I'm going to give you a, a ballpark uh, that okay. it was the late late 1800s. Okay. And I would. What do you think, think they the took moon. a picture of first? The moon. Okay. And I'm going to ask a question: Does it does it have to be a photograph, or can it be a daguerreotype? It can be a daguerreotype. Oh. Yeah, so then it was a, I think it was a daguerreotype of the moon, and I think it was 1883. Oh, even earlier than that. It was 1840. Wow. 1840. Oh, and that I was have uh, a slide with a daguerreotype on it, but I just couldn't remember the year. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, uh, it, it kind of has this weird, and, and I'll show it up here um, for you guys. Um, but for people who are listening, like it's this black and white looking photo and you can tell that there's a picture of the moon, but it kind of looks like, you know, that, that like thirties animation or whatever, where, where the moon had like something in its eye, smashing pumpkins did a video about it. And it's got all these little like bubbles and kinds of things, but it's definitely the moon. And you're right. That is a daguerreotype right there. Well done. What is a daguerreotype? 
Because I honestly don't have a clue what that is. Uh, I'm going to leave that to Ron. Uh <laughs> I couldn't explain the technology, but it was a precursor to photography with silver plates. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, they were talking about like uh, wet methods or something here. Uh, okay, so next one. Okay. Ron, you're winning right now. Um, the When was the first spectra of a star recorded? Am I still answering first? Yes. The first spectra mm -hmm. of a star. I'm going to go with the night. Well, I, okay, so back this up. I know that in the, the Hubble era, when actual Edwin Hubble was doing things, that there was some spectroscopy being done already, okay. I believe. So I'm going to say 19... 1910. Okay. Ron? I'm going to say a little bit later, 1920, 1920s. Uh, sorry to tell you, but you're both like 40 years off. It was 1863. Whoa. Wow. The English chemist William Allen Miller and English astronomer Sir William Huggins used the wet colloidian plate process to get the first ever photographic spectrogram of a star. And they actually did two stars. They did Sirius, makes sense, it's the brightest one, and they also did Capella. So wow, cool. But okay, no points for either of you on that one. All right. Let's uh all right, last one oh, and then we'll get into Yeah. We'll we'll get into so now lastly, what is this hobby that we're talking about actually called? Is it A astral photography? B starving artistry c old man yells at cloud or d your second mortgage <laughs> can there be another one for all of the above secret it's answer e e all of the above yeah. <laughs> you got it you got it i got it really yep that, that was it that, that was, was it, it. You, you win um although uh ron would you like to also pick e yeah i'll pick e Okay, there you go. Well, now our guest has won. So, well done. Good work. Good work. Is there some uh, good so some good trivia there, Rob? Uh, <laughs> see, a little bit a little bit difficult to get the exact dates, but I'm pretty happy with my results. Yeah, not bad. Not For, bad. 40 years uh, off. Oh well. How, now, I I knew none of this as of yesterday, so <laughs> Um so uh, speaking of science communication and and what we do here um, you know, I guess you, you started talking about where, what got you into astrophotography. Um, so, and, and you kind of got that itch from seeing that photo in there and, and then you had to scratch that itch. But so once you got into astrophotography, how did you start getting into actually teaching it to other people? And, and, and why are you doing that? Um, well, I've always been a teacher and I'm, I'm a communicator by nature, always have been. So in the daytime world, um, I have a PhD in biomedical chemistry and I've been a consultant for 35 years in toxicology. And uh, part of that work, a lot of that work, in fact, involves communication. So half of my practice is about helping scientists communicate complicated ideas more effectively. So I love to teach. I love to write. Um, what had to happen for me to be able to do that about astrophotography is I had to get good enough that that people want to get that stuff from me. And um, I, I struggled with Photoshop and some other software for quite a while. And then uh, I got a friend of mine, um, challenged me to try PixInsight. And so I took Photoshop off my machine. I tried PixInsight, struggled with that for a while, but then I found this website. Uh, this was a, it was a, you purchase these sets of tutorials called ip4ap.com, image processing for astrophotography. And there were three sets of about 20 four minute tutorials. And I like I ate them for breakfast and uh, I really learned PixInsight to the point that I wrote to the owners of the website 
and said, here's some before and after I learned your stuff. The owners of the website, of course, were Warren Keller and Pete Prue, who are now my partners. Uh, because I like to teach and, and, um, and write, Warren asked me to be the technical reviewer for his book, Inside Picks Inside. And I did that both editions. But that is how our relationship got started. And then we decided to start teaching live workshops. And we started doing that in 2017. When the pandemic hit, that had to stop, obviously. We had to cancel two workshops uh, that were booked. So they were booked for the spring of 2020. Uh, three days before the Buffalo workshop is when they basically closed the border. and and we couldn't continue. Um, but you can't keep a good man down. And it didn't take long before, uh, I don't remember who, which one of us had the idea to see if we could do some virtual workshops. That turned into Masters of Pix Insight. And IP for AP now is part of Masters of Pix Insight. So Masters of Pix Insight has two real components. One is a series of workshops and we do we run those online about once or twice a month uh, and you just pay to attend that workshop if you attend a workshop you can attend it anytime we repeat the same workshop you attend for free um, the other part of masters of picks and Space is that is what used to be ip for ap and that's a monthly or annual subscription and there are hundreds of videos, anywhere from two minutes to 15 minutes long, that provide, um, you know, up to date, quick tips, you know, how to get around certain window settings, a problem that you might be experiencing, a quick way to fix it, a new way to do something, introduce a new tool or a new script. Um, and if you I should say, if you want to check that out, uh, if you go to mastersofpixinsight.com, there is a one week free trial for IP for AP, image processing for astrophotography. So you can try that for a week and explore. There's um, my own little section in IP for AP is called Astrodocs Corner. So go and check that out. There's everything from soup to nuts in there in terms of uh, ways to get more proficient Pix Insight. And also for anybody who comes to any workshop or subscribes to IP for AP, you get to come to our free quarterly workshops. They're called Quick Tips. We do one about every three months. Uh, we have one coming up actually on the 26th. I think you heard about it. Warren's yep. going to be showing you how to access and use telescope live data. So, you know, like I said, you can't keep a good man down. We're really passionate about doing this. Masters of Picks Insight is about making our customers the masters. And, you know, like I have, we Warren and I both have a bunch of private students. Um, I have, I think, five that have won NASA APODs. That's got to be rewarding to you. Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. And, you know, not just APODs, but Image of the Day on an Astrobin. Which, yep. uh, you know, may be more prestigious, I think, than an APOD because there's more people involved in judging it. Right. I, you know, so. Um, more organic. Yep. But, and that is also why I write for Sky and Telescope and Amateur Astronomy and BBC Sky at Night. Um, I love to write. So I started writing for Sky and Tell, just wrote one piece for them. And that turned into a couple of pieces a year and now four or five pieces a year. And now I'm on the masthead as a contributing editor, which like imagine all those years ago, I'm looking at a scan telescope thinking, oh man, I have to try this. And now I'm, my own articles are in there. It's crazy. That's so cool. Very cool. It's nutty. So, so where is the coolest place that you've ever done astronomy? Oh boy. Um, probably the coolest place would be in a construction site 
in the west coast of Costa Rica. A construction so, site. A construction <laughs> site. So we had not what I was expecting were, at all. I know. We were looking to get some uh we were looking to get some property going and do like an astronomer's bed and breakfast up in the mountains on the west coast of Costa Rica. Didn't pan out, long story. But while while that was all kind of in the planning stages, we were going down there a couple of times a year. And uh, where we lived, the skies were not that bright or were not that dark because there was local lighting everywhere. But if you walked five minutes up the road, turned right, and went down into the valley, there was a construction site, a big clearing. And uh, that was probably the coolest, spookiest, most frightening <laughs> place I ever was because there was all kinds of weird jungle noises and animals that you don't recognize. Yep. But I was in a group. Uh, we were doing visual astronomy, and uh, the, the the highlight for me was seeing the Sculptor Galaxy, like okay. in your face, NGC mm. two five three, in your face. And the other highlight, same same time, was with binoculars. Ten, I had ten ten by forty two image stabilized binoculars, so about a four degree field, looking at Andromeda, and it overflowing the field oh really wow. oh that's great it was crazy so yeah that was the coolest place i ever observed i'm not really that excited you know i go to school parties I, I, I like visual observing when i'm i don't do um imaging usually um when i travel okay it's, so what portal class are you in at your house uh, about a five and a half, five, six. Oh, okay. Yeah, not, you know, it's not great, but it's not bad. You can work with it. Right. Yeah, the right, the right filters, especially. Yep. The right filters are the right strategies. Okay. You know, the most light polluted part of my sky is the east. Anything that's in the east is going to be in the west in a few hours. Sure. Right. Um, I have an auto mall to myself about two and a half miles away. And that ruins my southern sky up to about 40 degrees. Hmm. So I just don't shoot below 40 degrees. You know, you make it work. Yep. And, you know, I have access to all kinds of remote data, but I, I never feel like that's mine. Uh, I rarely process other people's data except for teaching. I'd rather struggle with the data that I can get from home. Oh, that's interesting because I sort of look at a lot of the astrophotography stuff. I look at it as people trying to do, trying to get like the best data, the most data, process it as, as much as you possibly can in a sense. Now, this is coming. We talked a little bit before the interview that like I'm a very, very, very newbie to this sort of astrophotography. Um, and I usually just take my camera out, uh, my DSLR and try to get those one shots. But it feels like it feels like you would actually want to get that data from a bigger telescope that you still have access to and process that data. But you're telling me you really you would rather have your hands in every part of it. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't say I'm after the best data. I'm after the most fun. Okay. You know, my wife says this: life is short, and then you die. Fair right? enough. Mm -hmm. And I, what fun is it just getting data from someone else? Well, when it's cloudy, or if you don't have a telescope, that's definitely an option. And you know when. When I'm unable to handle getting my own data myself, I'm going to use those remote sources. Of course I am. How can you argue with Hubble and web data? Everybody can get that, you know? Yeah. yeah. But if I'm really after the most fun, I got to be gathering the light myself. I got to be struggling with all the problems, the drivers and you know and right windows up unscheduled windows i've written articles about this 
underscheduled Windows updates, family commitments, clouds, work, you know? How much time do you actually get? Exactly. 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 And I think yeah. that's actually one of the reasons why I like using my DSLR because I can set up a cam or actually even my phone now. Uh, I can yep. set it up and get it out there, take a bunch of different shots. And as long as I'm not trying to take like a 30 minute shot, I can just keep taking them and taking them and experimenting. And then I have one in front of me. So my, my question to you now is like, so I've got that. I know how to operate a DSLR camera uh, for the most part. And so what would be like the next steps? Because I'm looking at what I'm doing here is ni nice and easy. Uh, and then I see Pix Insight as like that super duper camera, Swiss army knife type of thing. Like how do I go from DSLR camera photography to a Pix Insight level type of thing. Well, so let's break that down into a few parts. So first of all, you've only talked about the camera. You haven't talked about the optics at all, right? About the what? DSL, you, you talk about the camera, mm -hmm. the DSLR versus, a, say, a Gould astronomical camera. Okay. But what about the optics, hmm. right? If you're planning on using uh, a DSLR lens, stick with the DSLR. So the, the next step, so ne now move to a different part of your question. If you wanted to move from DSLR to something else, what would it be? If it's for deep sky astrophotography, it would be a cooled one shot color CMOS camera. It's gonna feel very, very much like your DSLR in use. The difference is, is the temperature of the chip will be stable, okay. which permits you to sh easily calibrate your images. And, uh, you know, you we were talking about the whole notion of um, science and being scientists. Um, the best data is calibrated data. You know, the, the pictures that come in raw contain um, contain photons that you don't want in there from the dark current of the camera from the bias signal that got added and from uh the optical properties of your system that might give you vignetting the presence of things like dust particles on the sensor or the filter you know okay. so having that stable temperature allows you to calibrate your frames and get rid of all that unwanted junk that's impacting the quality of your picture. Now, what if uh, uh, what if I didn't have the money to buy one of the one shot color CMOS cameras? Like, what I could, what is something that I could do with still just my DSLR? Like, can I use DSLR pictures uh, or images in absolutely. Pix Insight and all that? Oh yeah, Pix Insight will will process any type of image file. You're, so, the, you know, my CMOS, cool CMOS camera has the same sensor in it as a Nikon D850 camera. There's no difference in the sensor. The difference is in the back of the sensor, I have a cooler, you don't. That's the difference. Okay. Okay. So then because, so what you're saying is that because the sensor stays cooled, there's fewer artifacts in the pictures so then when i want to process them because i don't process anything right now if i do want to process them that's going to make them easier to work with is that is that what you're saying? it'll improve your signal to noise ratio okay yes but not only will the raw image be cleaner to start with but because of the stable temperature of the sensor it's very easy to make calibration frames bias dark and flat frames mm -hmm. that will further clean up that image so whether you stack or you don't stack you'll end up with a cleaner image you don't have to stack okay 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 uh and and pick so then the the other aspect of this is Astrophotography isn't one 
great big ball of stuff that you have to know all at the same time, right? I know people who will never learn how to collimate or operate a telescope because they use a remote telescope and, and have the data gathered. They want to process the data and make pictures. Um, there's other people. Uh, I have a friend in Australia who makes telescopes, likes to gather the data, but doesn't want to process it. He gives it to me to process. Yeah, okay. that might be where I'm kind of at. <laughs> I'm trying to say there's a couple of completely independent skill sets required for astrophotography. Right. Uh, acquisition is one thing. Processing is another. So you can learn how to process data from any source. Okay. And get good at that while you're still learning how to acquire your own good data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think this... Uh... It, it, it's it's such a, an interesting idea to go into this. It's one of those things that I've been wanting to do. Um, you know, I have a couple sets where I, I took like 10 pictures of the same thing, you know, with my telescope on a mount. And, and I tried and it didn't work. Like, it sounds like, like, I wish I could have like, um, just like a one-on-one, -on -one, like, here's, like, here are 10 of my pictures of the Pleiades. Um show me how to stack them show me show me how to do the bias and the and the other things um and and sort of do that step by step like that i think that's kind of the type of thing that that as a real brand newbie like that's the kind of thing i'm looking for um because it can look like a huge hurdle there's a there's that article that was it's part of the download package from the workshop that you attended the other night it's in uh it's in Sky and Telescope from 2017, and it's called Demystifying Image Calibration. And it actually tells you how to acquire the calibration frames. Okay. You know, now you, if you're using a DSLR, you have a few challenges because you don't have the temperature regulation, right? Right. So instead of, I, if I'm imaging at minus, t with my sensor at minus 10, I shoot minus 10 darks, right? But you can't really do that. Right. So what you kind of have to do is shoot some darks at the beginning of your session, pause in the middle and shoot some more. And then at the end, shoot some more. Okay. And throw those all in a pod. And on average, your frames will be okay. 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 So let me, let me ask you this. What, what would be the one skill like for me, who's just done DSLR single shot stuff, what would be the one skill that would give me the biggest bang for my buck in the images that I'm making? Like what's the one skill that you think would really make them pop better? Um, even if it's just, just doing the dark frames or just, learning how to stack or, or, or whatever. What do you think would be the, the biggest bang for my buck in, in one skill? I think learning how to stop because the, if you can shoot one frame, you can shoot 16. And if you can combine those 16, you're going to get an improvement in the image and the signal to noise ratio, no matter what else you do with it. Uh, an image composed of 16 subs is going to be better than one composed of a single five-minute sub. So if you're already able to get a good quality single sub, get good at, at uh, combining 16 or 20 of them. Okay. All right. That gives, that gives me a good direction because I'm just looking and, you know, like whoever it was, Emerson or somebody, you know, two paths diverged diverged in the wood, like I, I'm looking at 16 different paths right in front of me. <laughs> I mean, even if you don't want to calibrate your frames, you just want to align them together and stack them. You can do that in weighted batch pre-processing. You don't need calibration frames. Okay. So if you go, if you can shoot a single frame, you can shoot 20, just load those 20 into the script. It'll scream at you and tell you that there's no calibration frames and you did something wrong. Just click through it and it'll run. You know, it's, it's interesting. I've 
kind of gone through the journey um, for the past seven or eight years. And I've gotten all the way to the point where I was using, you know, monochrome filter wheels, the, the whole thing. Um, and sometimes it's just nice to step back and shoot some pictures with the DSLR mirrorless camera. And, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with kind of working backwards. If you're, if you're hitting a plateau or, um, if you're feeling like you're, you're hitting a wall, uh, and that's kind of where I've, what I've done recently. I, um, you know, have some kids now and I have less time and my skill set is rusty. And I just took a few steps back and I said, you know what, I, I really need to start fresh and have some successes because I was having a lot of gremlins in, you know, my, my process and having issues. And I just took my mirrorless camera out and hooked it up one night to the telescope and just took some images. And I was like, wow, this is, this is kind of cathartic, um, to be able to have some success like that. So you know, don't try to go too fast would be my suggestion. Um, you know, let it, let it kind of naturally make its way through, you know, your, your interest. And, you know, if you feel like you want to try a new thing, um, only change one thing at a time, you know, the scientific process. And that way your, your skill set doesn't grow beyond your actual ability to do anything with it because, you know, some people try to buy their way through this hobby and it's really not going to work. Um, the, the knowledge base is required. Yeah. And, you know, the, the move from a DSLR to a one shot color cooled CMOS camera, you'll find it, I think you'll find it really easy. And you'll find that it actually simplifies your imaging and improves your result. However, it's not free. Right, right. Right. It costs money. So you asked about that. You asked about that before though, Rob, and I wanted to say there's a very robust used market for cameras. Okay. Right there. I would say it's probably also a good idea if you're already on a DSLR to consider trying to hook it up to a laptop. Because if you're going to be going to a one shot color astronomy camera, um, most of them you need to hook up to a laptop. There are a few out there that you can use um, an intermediary device, um, like a little Raspberry Pi device. But most of the time people are imaging using a laptop and that can be done also with a DSLR. There's a number of software out there that can handle that. A lot of the software, in fact, can handle uh, the DSLRs and mirrorless cameras. And it allows you to start to learn that process too. Yeah, SGP, Nina, uh, of course, Backyard EOS and Backyard Nikon. Those were the ones I got started on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think if you're, I think, uh, I'm kind of thinking what would I do differently if I was starting over again? I think I would have decided sooner rather than later that I'm crazy about this. And I would have just gone for what I wanted right at the beginning. Because Do you mean in terms of spend, spending money or buying? Yeah, you spend a lot of money buying and selling stuff. I, th right? I agree with that. If I'd known how passionate I was going to be about this, I would have just bought all the right stuff at the beginning as soon as I could. You know, I know you can't buy it all at once. So if you, would, if you were to start now, like let's say somebody else is just going into this now knowing that you would spend, knowing they'd spend a lot of money, but... What, where do you see astrophotography going from here? Like right now we've got CMOS cameras. Uh, I'm starting to see cell phone cameras being used more often. Like where do you see it going in the next 10 years uh, so that like somebody who's wanting to get into it can like ride that wave now? Uh, mounts. So the mount is the heart of any astrophotography rig. Uh, it doesn't take the pictures, but it's it's the clock that counteracts the rotation of the Earth, right? So it keeps everything, keeps your stars ringing. Um, mounts are evolving, a, you know, quite a lot over the last few years. We're seeing strain wave mounts that work without counterweights. 
no clutches, balance doesn't matter as much. Um, on the on the software and camera side, um, I don't know how much the camera hardware is going to evolve, but I think the software and firmware is going to change. Richard Wright, uh, Accidental Astro is his thing at all. Uh, Richard Wright um, has written about this in Sky and Telescope. And uh, just to really quickly summarize, there's going to be a lot of things that happen in the camera that right now we're doing manually. So, for example, you might take five images in the camera and have them calibrated in the camera, registered and aligned, and then saved as a single frame. In fact, I, I had Richard on um, the last podcast that we had about live stacking and astrophotography and the future of it. And uh, I believe that's what you're referencing. So yeah, guys, check that out if you haven't uh, already listened or, or watched the podcast with Richard Wright, because it's, it's extremely exciting what he believes is going to be the next things in Astro. And to hear you say that, Ron, is exciting to have that second opinion. Just to be clear, though, it's not really a qualified second opinion. It's an understanding that Richard is a very, very insightful astrophotographer. And if he thinks this is coming, it's coming. Right. I've heard him talk about other things that were coming that came. <laughs> so, you know, if Richard says it's coming, I really believe it. He's probably working on the software to do it. I think that, that would be amazing. I, I've really enjoyed just the fact that, you know, the new phones, like they take a bunch of frames and stack it in there already and you get a decent picture. Like the I think it's amazing, and I see everything just getting easier and faster with that type of technology. Maybe not as good, right? Because with when you have better data, you can make a better picture, but or better. Yeah, but there's a lot to be said for fast and easy when you're, uh, you know, say a young parent with limited time, limited money, limited weather. Sometimes fast, you know, fast is good enough, right? I, I'm, I'm lucky. I have the luxury of, I now have the luxury of an observatory. I've got some good equipment and okay skies. I'm just ha I'm having a ball with it. I just have fun with it. AI is coming to astrophotography. Yep. It's not coming this year. Russ Croman has three AI based tools for, for picks inside. I think some of them work with other software as well. Blur Exterminator, which is a deconvolution tool. It makes images look sharper, although deconvolution is not the same as sharpening. We can have a conversation about that sometime. Uh, so he's got that deconvolution tool. He's got a star elimination tool, star exterminator. Yep. Takes all the stars out of the image. So from an image processing point of view, it's really nice to break your image up into, I think of it in three sections, background, target object and stars and it's if you can have those if you can deal with each of them as a separate challenge you can end up with a really nice picture so star exterminator helps with that uh, and then the last one is noise exterminator which really has to be seen to be believed uh, it's the by far the best noise elimination tool uh, that I've ever seen in PixInsight. And uh, not only that, but it actually gives you a little bit of detail enhancement as well. So uh, AI is uh, coming more and more into astrophotography. And I think that's kind of exciting and it's also kind of scary. But you know, is it gonna make it more fun? I like for me, it's all about, is I really enjoy this. So. So I, the last thing I'll ask is, um, you know, I personally am, you know, a science teacher. I come with the background of, you know, trying to look at these things from that perspective. I also have, you know, an interest in the pretty picture astrophotography stuff. Do you have any interest in the science? Have you done anything with, um, you know, more of the data collection side or trying to capture some sort of an event? Uh, not exactly, but I've been involved in a NASA project, 
um, to help remove cosmic ray damage from images that they take from the space station. Oh, cool. So they have a project uh, that was uh, working out of uh, the Rochester Institute of Technology. And um, I got to hear Don Pettit. He was one of the uh, astronauts that flew on the, on the space station. Took a lot of photos and he gave a talk at NIA about a few years ago. Anyway, they use uh, Nikon DSLRs on the space station in the, the Italian model called the Cupola that always faces Earth. And so they've got a bunch of Nikon cameras. They're taking pictures all the time. But these sensors in the camera build up damage from cosmic ray hits. And so they look, the pictures out of them have like red, green, and blue speckling throughout them. So Don, and Don Pettit in his talk, he said, you know, if anybody has any ideas about how we could fix them, let me know. And mm -hmm. uh, I thought about it a little bit and uh, came up with a way to do it in Pixinsight. And uh, so was invited to be part of that. That's uh, awesome. That team. Yeah, it was really cool. I got my name on NASA letterhead. <laughs> oh, fantastic. For the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> That's a win. And uh, right you also asked about the science. So every time I post a picture, I write about the object. Uh, I'm a scientist by day. I, I'm very interested in the cosmos from a, um, let's say, an academic perspective. I'm very interested. Um, when I'm doing astrophotography, for me, it's mostly about making pretty pictures. But when I'm posting, I want to tell the story of the object. And I want to, I also give all my processing details. So I want to tell the story of how I made the picture. Right. You capture the mind and the heart at the same time with some of these pictures. It's amazing. That's what it does for me. You know, it's, it's like an intellectual pursuit that exposes beauty that you could never see. Right. You know, it's, it, it combines, it hits a lot of good check boxes for me. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's why we all enjoy it, too. And I think one of the cool things about astrophotography, especially some of the deep sky stuff, is you're picking up on things with those cameras that uh, you can't see without a camera. I, I think that's that's pretty amazing. I want to share a, a little meme with you, and I want to see what you think of this. You know, tell us what people are missing about this one. Now, for the audience um, who's listening, what we're going to look at is a picture. And just think of the moon. Think of the full moon on a beautiful night. It's a little bit cloudy. You can, um, you can see the moon. You can see the, the craters. You can see the Maria. You can sort of see the clouds around. And it's just phenomenal. Um, and then you go to take a picture of it with your cell phone. And it's just junk, <laughs> right? I mean, even even with my DSLR, I, I see something like that top picture with the moon that looks just gorgeous and beautiful. And I take out my DSLR and it just it just doesn't match up. Um, what what do you think for for normal people out there? Like what what are they what do they forget? Like what what, are, what do they not know based on that? The moon is really tiny. Yeah. And far away. If you hold your arm up at arm's length with your baby finger sticking out, your fingernail of your baby finger will cover the moon. That's how small it is on the sky. Yeah. So now do that with anything else in your surroundings and take a picture with your cell phone. It's going to be small. Yep. For sure. And if it's not, it's going to be blurry because the autofocus mechanisms don't work properly. And the other weird thing is how it looks different at the horizon, but it's actually no different. It's, it's just an optical illusion. You can do the exact same thing with your finger. You can hold it out and it's the same exact size as it is when it's up in the sky. And lots of people, you know, I, myself included, kind of that, that optical illusion catches you. But uh, once you do that little test, it's obvious that it's, it's just that. I've always been impressed with the way our eyes can 
really in, or really our brains interpret the image to have such high dynamic range where we can see the Maria, but then we can also see the stars behind the moon. But when you get a camera out, you just, uh, even a DSLR, like you can't quite get that same high dynamic range. And there are ways to do that, I know, but it's, it's pretty amazing. Our brains are amazingly terrible pattern seeking machines. <laughs> oh yeah. Crazy. How can people find you on the internet? And is there anything that else that you would like to plug tonight? My website is astrodoc.ca. You can find me at mastersofpixinsight.com. And you can also find me at my email address or on Facebook. My email address is rbreacher at rogers.com. That's R-B-R-E-C-H-E-R at rogers, R-O-G-E-R-S dot com. And you can message me on Facebook if you want lessons just reach out go to the website every picture i post tons of information all my articles that i write are up there um there's nothing for purchase on that website it's all everything up there is free to access enjoy it ron i want to i'm going to put you on the spot here uh Rob, you know, as, as he said, is just getting started the, your recommendation to do some stacking, um, of images was I think spot on. And I know that, uh, your experience here, um, in Pix Insight is second to none. Um, I'd love to have you back at some point to discuss, you know, how that process works. If you're interested. Um, would you be interested to come back on sometime with us and uh, maybe take Rob through that process? I'd love to come back on the show. I like doing things like this. And um, maybe what we can do is take a one-shot color master and put it through an abbreviated workflow that gives a really nice result in, you know, nine or ten steps. But to be fair, it's still nine or ten tools that you have to learn how to use. You know, uh, I have friends who are great carpenters. Uh, you could give me the best hammer in the world. I could never build you a house because <laughs> I don't know how to use it. Right. Right. But right. you could give them a pretty mediocre hammer and they'll still build you a really good house. Right. Yeah. So you, you have to put in the time to learn how to use the tools. Well, we really appreciate you coming on. Um, I'm looking forward to that next time. Um, guys, uh, this is, you know, only possible by uh, having the support of our audience. And if you could help us out, we are trying to grow our Patreon. Um, I know that there's people who are listening right now. Uh, if you haven't seen Ron's images, uh, check out his website. Once again, that's astrodoc.ca. And Rob, uh, thank you again for your amazing uh, and very difficult trivia. <laughs> You're very welcome. Happy to, happy to help. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. And uh, clear skies, as Ron would say. See you later, gang. See ya.